side, that is to say the promise of mobility, which was the promise of Abraham Lincoln, has sadly been dissipated by a new class of people who dominate the airwaves, the academy, the professions, and who are the new aristocrats, and who design a series of laws to ensure that they will stay on top. And how do you do that if you're an aristocrat? What you want is a series of laws and institutions that will prevent the spawn of your gardener and your maid to move in next door to you. And so what you'd want would be an education system that doesn't work. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. You just heard F.H. Buckley, foundation professor at George Mason University, speaking on the unchecked presidential power we're witnessing today in our government. Buckley explains that what we assume was the U.S. Constitution's guarantee of a separation of powers was not what the founders had in mind. What they expected was a country in which Congress would dominate the government and in which the president would play a much smaller role. This is a presentation that was delivered as part of the 2014 Acton Lecture Series. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. I want to personally tell you how wonderful it is to be here. Um, it's for an author. Always wonderful to be able to talk about his book, but to talk about his book and to see it in front of him is very heaven. So I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a, a guest of Mackinac and Acton. Mackinac is one of the best, if not the best, of the state think tanks. Uh, Acton is absolutely superb in what it does, and uh, a free plug, Acton has all these educational programs, and I'm sure many of you have taken part in them, but keep your eyes open for them because they're, they're absolutely great. Well, I'm, I'm essentially from Washington. I live in, in, in Alexandria. I, I teach in Arlington, and, and, and Mike was right. Um, I mean, absolute power corrupts, or as we say in in Washington, absolute power corrupts, and, and or power corrupts, and absolute power is even better. <laughs> so, uh, so what I want to talk about is a different kind of liberty, a lawyer's kind of liberty, the framers' kind of liberty, constitutional liberty. So the question is, if you want to live in a free country, what are the structures of government that you'd like to see in place? And I got interested in this. I mean, my background is not constitutional law. I got interested in this uh, essentially as a layman and not a constitutional scholar. I observed, for example, that in rankings of economic freedom put out by people like Cato and Heritage, the United States was dropping like a stone. Uh, uh, you know, one, one notices this. And then I thought, well, I'm going to test this empirically. And some of you will recall that when William F. Buckley Jr. talked about his novels, he referred to the, uh, the obligatory sexual scenes in his novels. And as I'm from a quant school, George Mason, for us what's obligatory is some number crunching. So here's what I did. I looked at what predicts political freedom in a country. And in my model, I, re I read a big large-scale regression with about 4,000 observations, about 140 countries over a 39-year period. And here's how it works. Um, the world can be divided roughly into three parts. There are some countries that are totally, really unfree, no political freedom to speak of, of which the largest is China. There are some countries that have a parliamentary system of government, and there are some countries that have a presidential system of government. So I wanted to see what the difference was in terms of freedom. So the way you do this is, is firstly you find an objective measure of freedom, and I picked something put out by Freedom House, 
which is a, a, a non-governmental organization, but whatever I picked would have been the same. And then I divided countries into presidential versus parliamentary, and I looked at a whole bunch of other things like inequality, uh, how robust the economy is, um, how long the country's been independent, whether it had a, a British background, things like that. And when I ran the numbers, what I discovered was presidential regimes are bad for liberty. It's no question. I mean, you can't kill that result. You can play with the numbers all you want. You can manipulate them all you want. Well, one thing that becomes clear is the American system of government did not export well. All right? It was exported to Latin America, to a bunch of other countries, and these are not countries noted for their freedom. And parliamentary systems did better. The next thing I did was I compared the U.S. presidential system with other presidential systems. So what I did there was for all the parliamentary systems, and by the way, I never used any of the really dictatorial regimes like China in my model. So I took all the parliamentary countries out and I ran a regression where I just had the U.S. and all other presidential regimes. When I did that, and I just looked to see whether a U.S. variable would predict freedom, well, it did big time. So the message is, yeah, America is an exceptional nation. It's exceptional because it's free in spite of its constitution. That's what I concluded. And then, taking it one step further, I wanted to see, well, you know, what else helps predict why America stands out? And what I got were three things. Firstly, it's British heritage, right? Along with Australia, New Zealand, Canada, other countries, the West Indies countries, uh, other countries that were formerly British seem to do well. The big contrast, of course, is with Latin American countries. Do you remember when the colonists in the 1770s talked about how they wanted British liberty? Well, it meant something, right? Where the alternative was French liberty or Spanish liberty, things that really didn't much exist. So having that, that heritage, which is also an experience in participation in government during the colonial period, having that experience helped. The other thing that helped was money, right? Wealthy societies tend not to become dictatorial. People are fairly satisfied. The dangerous kinds of countries in terms of liberty are countries like Venezuela, which are not rich or where the money is not spread around very well. And the other thing that mattered was how many years the country's been independent. And what I did is I arbitrarily started at 1800 up to 2010, so I got 210 years and I normalized it from zero to one. And what I, what I looked, what I found was the longer a country's been independent, the less likely it was to slip into dictatorship. So, you know, America would be the oldest but it's the more recent countries that experience freedom that, that had problems maintaining it. Right? So in other words, yes, America is uh, an exceptional nation, but it's not because of its constitution. It's because of something else. By the way, in terms of that independence variable, recall that in the 13 colonies, their history began not in 1776 or 1787, but long before, and in the case of Virginia, it went back to 1607. So 40% of Virginian history is colonial history, and that was a history of people you know, going to Williamsburg or going to Richmond and participating in government, right? And experiencing fights with the governors at the time, which was called the gridlock of the time. So there I was, I had this rather unpatriotic result, right? Um, I have a joint background. I mean, I'm, I'm Canadian as well as American. I became an American citizen recently, not so long ago, in April, April 15, <laughs> tax day. Tax day, come on. They said, here's your citizenship and here's the bill too, <laughs> right? Um, so I didn't feel terribly patriotic, right? You know, I mean, I came up with the wrong result there but the numbers don't lie. 
And I've been interviewed on this, and people said, it sounds to me like you're pumping for a, a parliamentary form of government. They said, Americans won't like that. I said, that's funny, it was huge in Canada. You know? So I then went back to the framers, and I'll tell you something, if you want to read a brilliant set of materials on the structure of liberty, on constitutional liberty, you'll never do better than the framers' debates transcribed by Madison. Not the Federalist Papers, but the framers' debates themselves. And I realized to do this, what I'd have to do would be to diminish the role of the Federalist Papers, and that was a labor of love. I mean, come on, you know, little Jemmy Madison, the hypochondriac who had lived them all. That was the fun part of it, <laughs> right? What I enjoyed was going to see the actual debates because there you had real live people arguing with one another. And everything was on the table. And we'd like to think, well, of course it had to turn out the way it did, but not at all, right? A country could have split up. It very nearly did split up. There was a British spy there. All the proceedings were to be kept quiet. Well, somebody blabbed. Right. One delegate said, I don't trust you, gentleman from the North. Another delegate from the North said, we may take a war to unite this country. And then you'll see some of you people hanging from the hangman's noose. That was how they talked. It nearly fell apart. You'll never see this in the Federalist Papers. But that's a selling document, written, by the way, by two people who were most disappointed by the result. Right? Hamilton didn't want anything like that. Right? Hamilton would have been happy in England. I mean, he would have been... He would have liked the monarchy, except, what can you say, Americans didn't want a king? Darn them. As for Madison, Madison came to town with an idea that the House of Representatives should choose the Senate, and the two bodies should choose the president, and the national government should have the right to veto state laws. And he got all that. He got all that. Except he got it in Canada, right? So if you want to call little Jemmy Madison the father of his country, then this was one of those cases, not unknown in delivery rooms, where the child bore little resemblance to the father. So Madison, who wrote to Jefferson right at the end of the convention, saying this will answer none of our problems. Madison and Hamilton, the guy so much in the outs that he, nobody will talk to him. They conspire to write the Federalist Papers, a document that they scarcely believed in, right? And which should be taken with a grain of salt. Where there, when, therefore, someone like oh, John Yu talks about energy in the executive, don't believe a word of it. Federalist 70. What you get from the framers' debates was a very, very different idea about what the president should be like. You get the idea from some that what the president should do would be the equivalent of you getting a box of a table from Ikea with some instructions on how to put it together, right? And you take it out and you screw this in here. No discretion in short. That's how Roger Sherman thought it would be. No discretion. None of the framers anticipated the modern regulatory state. They didn't anticipate the president would be so powerful because they didn't anticipate Washington would be so powerful. Right? They also expected, by the way, that Congress would appoint the president. Right? They thought the electors would have real choices to make, but if you'll recall in the Constitution, it provides that if you don't get a majority of votes in the Electoral College, then it's kicked over to the House of Representatives voting by state. And that's what they thought would happen nearly all the time. Right? So they wrote a Constitution for one kind of technology, and we have a different kind now. We have a technology where people can move around, where there's mass communication, and where you, you won't get a situation where nobody gets a majority of votes. They knew Washington would. What they didn't know is that anyone after him would. They thought you'd get candidates from the north and from the middle states and from the south, and nobody would know anybody about it. 
another region. And so it would be kicked over to the House of Representatives, voting by state. Another example of how the document they produced was one which enshrined state power rather than power from Washington. In short, what they would have given us is a constitution shorn of the overreach of presidential power that we see now. The other difference, of course, was the rise of modern communications and the tendency of the media to make a rock star of the president. Right. So there was that in the case of Washington, but obviously nobody else at the time. Right. And you put all that together, you know, the rise of the regulatory state, the rise of the power in Washington, right? the, uh, the national candidates that emerge, the role of the media in making rock stars of presidents. And what you end up with is a very different kind of constitution. Right? And one not even like the constitution of separation of powers, which, which is not the one the framers wanted, one that you know, developed later on. What you get is a constitution of an overpowerful president, and that is, if one is interested in liberty, a problem. By the way, when I wrote the book a couple of years back, I, you know, you're always predicting the future, aren't you, a little bit, right? And so I had to worry, I mean, would the clock turn back? Would we see a more modest president? But happily, Obama was with me every step of the way, <laughs> right? I suppose I have a bit of a vested interest in the bad result here. Um, so now we end up with a regime in which the president can make law by diktat and not enforce the kinds of laws he doesn't want. And there isn't much one can do about that, right? The separation of powers, which was thought to be such a great idea in the Federalist Papers, describes a constitution now long gone. And indeed, the idea of a separation of powers makes the president all the more powerful because what it produces is the gridlock of divided government and a president who says, if Congress does not act, I must do so. And he is encouraged to do so by many members of the media, by the New York Times, by a lot of Americans, right? Now, one would like to think that Congress will be something more than a venue for the State of the Union address, but by virtue of the impuissance of Congress and the unwillingness of the members of Congress to step up to the constitutional role, alas, we're moving to a regime of almost unlimited presidential power. So you'll recall that I said that presidentialism is not good for liberty or presidential regimes are not good for liberty and America is free, right? But if you had to wonder where things will be 30 or 40 years from now, then you have to wonder about how it is the case that of all the countries that have a presidential regime, almost America only is the only one that's politically free. By the way, I don't say that it's the only country, the only presidential regime that's politically free, but name three. Not so easy. Mostly they're like Costa Bananas. Yeah. Well, we're not going to get there soon. We may never get there. But the rise of power in a President Obama makes one wonder, right? There is one last pathology, I might call it, to the American Constitution. And then we'll take questions. And that's one that will not have occurred to you as in any way important, but which seems to me very important, and that is that in a presidential regime, the president is the head of state as well as the head of government. What I prefer is what I call Jack Spratt's law. Jack Spratt's law, Jack Spratt, you'll recall, ate all the lean and his wife ate all the fat and together they licked the plate clean. And I say countries are freer when the ceremonial fat of head of government is separated from the lean meat, or the head of state is separated from the lean meat of head of government. Because when you put them together, disagreeing with the president turns out to be slightly disloyal. Now, that doesn't happen in, say, Britain, 
right, or in parliamentary regimes, because there your politicians are figures of fun. They're buffoons. You should be encouraged to laugh at them. That is good for liberty. It is not good for liberty if every time there's a national tragedy, you require a healing speech from the president and a Peggy Noonan who will weep all over the pages of the Wall Street Journal about how wonderful it was. Right? It is not good for liberty if meritorious acts are, rec are recognized with a Presidential Medal of Freedom or this, that, or the other thing. That should be done by the Queen. I have a mic here, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. And uh... Yeah, um, please forgive my uh, not understanding. When you talked about exceptionalism to begin with and those factors, mm -hmm. you didn't mention uh, the United States being the only self-proclaimed nation being based on the foundation of two major religions and our moral religious foundation. Um, does that play into exceptionalism? I know that's hard to codify. And if so, where are those religious folks who need to reassert God, not state, is supreme? Well, I, I agree with much of what you said to the extent that I think that nearly all of our morality is parasitic upon Christianity or Judaism. But did this influence the founders? It influenced the people in 1776 greatly. As for the people in Philadelphia in 1787, most, I expect, were sincere Christians. I'm sure of that. Do you recall that incident where that notorious deist, at the time when the convention was about to split apart, when it looked like we'd end up with two or three different countries, where he said, gentlemen, if it's the case that not a bird can fall from heaven, without the intervention of the divine. How is it we have forgotten to seek the aid of the divine here? What, let, us, let us ask to have our meetings blessed by a minister of the cloth. And someone said, um, I think Hamilton said, well, the, the plain fact is we don't have enough money to do that. And someone else allegedly said, yes, and we have no need for foreign intervention. Um, so there were some deists amongst them. I mean, my homeboy, George Washington, attended Christ Church in Alexandria, but never took communion. Um, many of these people, I think particularly many of the Virginians, were high and dry Anglicans. And they had kind of missed the Great Awakening of the 1740s. One saw more of that after the Second Great Awakening. Lee, another homeboy, did take communion at Christ Church. Um, there is a theory that we become increasingly religious as a nation, that indeed we started as a frontier society. Frontier societies are not particularly religious and become more religious in time. I'm not sure if that, I don't think that's true anymore. But yes, there, there was a religious impulse at, at the founding. Um, probably less so for many of the South American countries 30 years later. Um, I haven't answered your question, but <laughs> I've talked around it. <laughs> yeah. Pr Professor, I have, I have two definitional questions from your analysis. One, is it, is it at all helpful to think of China, of communist China, as a democracy but with extremely limited franchise, just the, the three million members, whatever that, do they vote sort of secretly or whatever among themselves? And two, could you say more about what is really the, the difference in a presidential system? Is it the direct election of the president? How are you defining a presidential system? Well, I'll take the second one first. If I forget the first, you'll tell me. Um, I, def in, in, I mean, in my book, I, I list all the countries, and I define presidential as a country where uh, 
presidents were separately elected, not chosen by the legislature, and where presidents, moreover, exerted real power. So in the case of, say, a country like Germany, which had both a chancellor and a president, but a president who was a figurehead, that's parliamentary. Um, there were some in-between kinds of cases. By the way, when I, I said that the question is, name three free presidential countries, there are exactly three. Chile and Uruguay, who have had mixed histories and are not poster children for freedom. And France, which is also not quite a poster child. But the th here's the thing about France. France has a, a semi-presidential regime in that the Chamber of Deputies appoints the cabinet and can fire it. So it's, it's, it could be called parliamentary. It's, I think it's really presidential. But calling it presidential actually makes presidential look better than it otherwise would. Um, and your first question was about China. So until recently, there was something called the Washington Consensus. And the Washington Consensus, as you know, is inevitably um, economic prosperity leads to political freedom. And the example there is Chile. And the counterexample today is China. And it is wondered whether something called a Beijing consensus is replacing the Washington consensus. And the Beijing consensus is, look, we're going to give you, you know, speaking to the, the people, we're going to give you economic freedom. Just don't bother us about political freedom. Right? And so the question is, will that persist? Frank Fukuyama, by the way, thinks it won't, or it might not. Frank Fukuyama thinks that what you need to keep a country together is something more than prosperity, economic prosperity. You also need a core faith. And that he didn't think was supplied by Confucianism as it is by Christianity in the West. I mean, this is just speculation, no? Other questions? Speak right, speak right into the top. Uh, here in Michigan, we've got some interest in moving toward a part-time legislature, and it's a good many conservatives and libertarians who are pushing for that. Should we be rethinking that uh, in light of... Well, the, uh, the idea is, you know, it's, it's a... I guess it's a Vermont idea originally, is they'll legislate less. Happily in Washington, we don't have that problem. They don't legislate at all. Right, and so the result has been an all-powerful president. I don't know enough about Michigan. Would you have a runaway governor who would assume all powers in those kinds of cases? Well, you need people to hold him to his job and to limit his job. So, you know, getting legislators to do the trick is the way the framers thought it would happen. I'm not, so I'm not so sure about pure democracy. It works better in the 19th century where you don't have a state that tries to do absolutely everything. I'm wondering if um, you could predict a winner or a loser uh, in this scenario. Now we've got the leader of the Senate and the leader of the House threatening the president should he overreach with more executive orders. Um, given the fact we haven't seen exactly this situation recently, I'm wondering if, if you have any ideas about winners or potential losers in that scenario. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say goodbye to the filibuster, which was not something in the framers' debates at any time. I see an interesting possibility in uh, a coalition between Republicans in Congress and some Dems in Congress, which might just give the coalition of the majority 67 votes for an override. Maybe that's speculation on my, it's wishful thinking on my part, I suspect. Um, short of that, I don't see the courts doing it, right? I mean, the Supreme Court just took certiorari on a new Obamacare decision. My read on that was that four justices did so. It takes four only. These would be the dissenters in the Sibelius decision of 2012. They were furious at John Roberts. What better way to embarrass him than to bring it back before the Supreme Court? 
Roberts' interpretation of legislation came down roughly this. Come hell or high water, if there's any way to uphold legislation, I'll do it. It's an extreme version of what is called the political doctrine, which is politics is left to the people and not to the courts. There's something to be said for that, right? People who recall decisions like Roe v. Wade may not be happy to let courts make these kinds of decisions. I don't anyway. So I expect what will happen will be simply an embarrassment for John Roberts. You see, Roberts will be called upon either to oppose Obamacare, and he doesn't like it, or to reveal himself to be an unprincipled and unscrupulous person as he was in 2012. What he'll do, I don't know. But I think Scalia will have fun. I have a question. Yeah. And then we'll get to you real quick. Yeah. Just thinking of... Um, monarchialism, mm -hmm. royalty. Do you see, even in our own system now, it started with Camelot, and a particular Joseph Kennedy, who envisioned for his family a pedigree of leadership, and it's happened successively, but, but also H.W. Bush, mm -hmm. W. Bush, Mr. Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, Jeb Bush. Don't say it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, do you begin to see? I know, and, yeah. And what oh, I just Rand read Paul. Right. And I said, I just read recently where at Mr. Obama's retirement, they plan to go to a state where Mrs. Obama can run for Senate so that she can begin her journey to Washington. So my question is are we breeding in our own country our own monarchs? if not by DNA or pedigree, we certainly are lining up a certain number of families to become the monarchs of our nation. What well, do you think I, of that? Well, ironically, this is what I'm writing about right now, my current project. I have a Darwinian project. I argue that aristocracy is the natural state of any society. And what do you need to get a stock aristocracy going? It's very simple. Two things. You need to have a concern for how your children will do. No problem. And you need further to have a concern as to how they will do relative to other people, what is called relative preferences. And when you put them together, what you get is aristocracy. And so I say that's natural. It is the natural default position of any society. And those people who fight against it always have an uphill battle, which may explain why we have more or less an aristocracy Today. I mean, it's not monarchism, but it's an aristocracy. You're describing an aristocracy. It's not, by the way, the Brett's peerage, Burke's peerage, right? It's not an aristocracy which goes back to the 13th century. But then even in Britain, a good run would be three or four generations, and then you descend to the mass, right? In the current House of Lords, uh, there, aren't that, there are very few people who can trace their lineage back before 1800. And so, yes, you have Joe Kennedy, right? And you have his, actually, you go back earlier. You start with Honeyfitz, mayor of Boston, John Fitzgerald, and then Joe, and then the kids. But now, you know, now what you have is simply a bad embarrassment of grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So it's an aristocracy where three or four generations on top will be enough to do it. And when I say America is an aristocracy, I'm not making this up. America is one of the least mobile countries in the world. We were taught to think that this is the land of opportunity, that the great thing about America is wherever you are, you can get ahead. But it turns out that country is not America. It's Denmark, right? America is about tied with Britain in terms of immobility, and most of the first world is more mobile, right? That is to say, the promise of mobility, which was the promise of Abraham Lincoln, has sadly been dissipated by a new class of people who dominate the airwaves, the academy, the professions, and who are the new aristocrats, and who design a series of laws to ensure that they will stay on top. And how do you do that if you're an aristocrat? 
What you want is a series of laws and institutions that will prevent the spawn of your gardener and your maid to move in next door to you. And so what you'd want would be an education system that doesn't work, a K-12 system that's broken, because that should be an elevator to the middle class. Well, we don't want that. We want an immigration system that brings in the maids and the gardeners, but not people who will compete for jobs with the upper class, right? And we don't want the rule of law either, right? The new man makes his way without friends and allies, without the network of people that members of a new class have, and they do it, these members of a new class, the rising class, right, through institutions like contract and property. And therefore, those institutions must be attacked, as they are in the courts. And you end up with a tort system that looks like a <coughs> judicially sanctioned, demented form of, th of theft. Right? We have all these things in America. They are less to be found, much less to be found in other countries. And if you are a member of the world, of the, 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 the aristocracy of America, life is good. As someone who spent about 30 years in local and county politics, yeah. I can tell you, we have term limits in this state. And everybody thinks they're wonderful, but it's become a family organization thing where they're bouncing around from county commission, senate, back again to county yeah. commission for their holding pattern. In Oakland County, it's a disaster. And, but people still love their term limits. They think it works. And one of the things that's come up a lot of Lately, I have a club, and we had a speaker the other night, a Republican club, and he, he had run and lost, but he wanted to talk about the apathy that's out there because people just don't feel like their vote really means anything, that, you know, the money is going to buy the positions, and that's it. I might as well stay home or go to work that day and make a few bucks myself. And, and then the other thing I wanted to just touch base with you on is uh, Jonathan Gruber, and his brilliant comments that have just come out on how they developed Obamacare and created it so that it would be cumbersome, burdensome for everybody, everybody to read because the stupid vote, that was the only way they get it past the stupid voters. But what I noticed in the whole thing was they got it past the stupid Democrats too in Congress and they'd all lost, yeah. most of them. So well, you remember you had to pass um, it to see what was. Yeah. Well, you've, you, you've mentioned a, a, a number of things. Uh, by the way, this, this Gruber guy, I mean, look, I, I've read it. I mean, the places I look for my news, yeah, it's been all over. But has it been in regular newspapers? I mean, I didn't see it in the Washington Post. Yeah. So you've got a, you have a class of courtiers in the press, right? And, and a back and forth street between the administration and, and members of the media. Um, you know, term limits was something the framers spent a lot of time talking about, and it really interested them, and they were kind of divided on it. I mean, they, they, they saw problems with term limits. I mean, they, they did the revolving door, which is certainly there. Um, they weren't paying that much attention to. Do you know what they were worried about was end period misbehavior, and end period misbehavior is what we have now with President Obama. So put yourself, I mean, try to imagine what his incentives are right now. You know, I mean, you, like, he's weighing things on the scale. And, and one scale is what is good for the country. Okay. But there's this other scale. And what goes there? Well, maybe what's good for the Democratic Party, but more what's good for me, my family. So weird things can happen. Uh, by the way, when I said that the presidential regime would be one where presidents would want the people at the back, at your back if you're president, in other words, you'll take on Congress, but you'll want to do so over an issue where you think you've got the popular support. One exception, immigration. Why? 
because with immigration we're talking about the wishes not of the present population but of the voting population some years down the road. So you'd want an immigration system that will bring in your, your supporters. You know, by the way, the immigration issue was one where at all times and in all places, people thought, how are they going to vote? And they worried about that in the 1790s. You know? The open door policy from Lincoln's time to the 1920s right, came at a time when immigrants split their votes. Right? You had the Irish who were going to vote Democratic, but you also had the Germans and the Swedes who were going to go to Minnesota and vote Republican. Right? So they split their votes. So it, it wasn't a political issue, although it became so by the 1920s, and it was the Republicans who shut the door. My thought in immigration reform is unless you take on family preferences, it's not worth doing. We have time for one more question. A good one. John, do you have a question? John has a question. Okay. Six years old. This ought to be good. Oh, don't patronize the kid. Why is it called Acton Institute? <laughs> you, better, you better ask your dad about that one. <laughs> I didn't even hear. Well, he asked, why do we call it the Acton Institute? I'll take care of that one. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering too, why not Acton Foundation, Acton Center, well, whatever. Uh, yeah. Earlier you spoke about uh, congressional gridlock and, you can whoops, speak right to the top. Earlier you spoke about uh, gridlock, and, oh, <laughs> okay, uh, gridlock in Congress, and yet since the uh, uh, FDR uh, presidential uh, uh, term, it seems like there's been a tremendous growth in regulatory action funded by Congress, also supported by Congress, where more and more economic and political decisions are not made in Congress, but made through indirectly through the regulatory structure. Um, has this folk, uh, played any part in your, yep. your analysis? Let me, let me say two things about that. Firstly, um, it's a different country than it was 50 years back. 50 years, I mean, we're, we're living with divided government, but we've often seen divided government. I mean, the great exception was Congress in 1934, the great 100 days of FDR, where a ton of legislation was passed and the White House would send it down and it would be knee-jerk approved by Congress. Right, that's the exception. Studies of how Congress and the presidency worked in the 50s, 60s, and 70s report that there was as much legislation passed in divided Congresses as in Congresses where the party was the same as that of the president. What's the difference now? The difference now is we are a much more divided country, right? that many of the people here, I suspect, whatever their politics, would end up agreeing about people they liked back when. A lot of Kennedy Democrats, I suspect, around. I mean, that was the conservative party back then in some respects, right? So the idea that I am defined by the party I belong to rather than by being an American, that's fairly new, right? Uh, the Pew folks who run their surveys report that people get are likely to get defriended over political disputes, right? I mean, we just don't have friends so much on the other side. Um, religion probably plays a part in that. One used to go to churches where you had people all over the map in terms of their politics, and less so now. I mean, some people don't go to church, 20%. Right, but it's also the case that you tend to be people of your own political ideology, that it dominates everything. And so divided government is much more likely to produce gridlock than, than today. Your second, what you asked about was the regulatory state. Yeah, 
The regulatory state has grown in parliamentary and presidential regimes at an equal clip, right? At the time when there is the New Deal here, there are the same things happening in Australia or Canada, right? The regulatory state grows by leaps and bounds all over the world, the first world, at about the same time. More, more in the States, I admit. Why? Because it's bigger, richer. <coughs> but this is a reason why presidential government has become more powerful, right? People in the past used to say, this is a new tyranny. Lord Hewitt in England in 1929 wrote a book about this, called it The New Despotism. The despotism was uh, regulators making decisions without being controlled by political leaders. It's not like that. Many of you perhaps saw a TV series from Britain called Yes Minister, and the idea behind it, the conceit behind it is, you know, you, you get a new politician in office, and he's given one ministry or another, and he knows beans about the subject, but he's got his personal private secretary who's going to make all the decisions, right? And wh whose art it is to hide the art, who will somehow let the minister think the ideas are coming from the minister, but he's really running the show. Well, that was an amusing fiction, but it was only a fiction because the decisions are made by politicians. And what happens in all countries is they're made not just by politicians and not by cabinet ministers, but they're made by the presidents and the prime ministers. Um, I think Obama's had only a couple of cabinet, three or four cabinet meetings this year. One has cabinet meetings. What is the purpose of a cabinet meeting? It is not to get a discussion going about how to run the government. Rather, it is an opportunity to tell the cabinet members how to get with the message, right? Because the decision comes from on top. And that's whether or not it's parliamentary or presidential, right? The difference is in a parliamentary regime, there are ways of keeping the power of the leader, the executive, constrained. He has to appear before parliament. He can't hide behind a lectern. You know that Obama showed up at the Lok Sabha in India in 2010, and the, the members of parliament couldn't believe it. He had a, he had a, you know, he had a lectern with, uh, what was that glass mirror? The, uh, teleprompter. They had never seen a teleprompter. I mean, how, who, would, who would have a teleprompter in parliament? It's, a, it's against the spirit of the thing. Instead, what you're supposed to do in Parliament is, if you're the Prime Minister, is show up all the time and be aware of all of the questions that can be thrown your way and to answer them in a spontaneous and witty manner and in Canada in two languages. So, how would Obama pass that test? We know George Bush wouldn't. Clinton might have done well. No. It brings a different kind of leader to the fore where you don't have that kind of check on your egotism. It makes you a little more humble. So the egomaniac doesn't work so well in, in a parliamentary regime, right? He can't separate himself in a cocoon, right? Granting interviews only to some adoring, fawning reporters a couple of times a year. Instead, he has to face people whose mission in life is to take you down, right? Or, you know, in my family, like the dinner table. Well, <clears throat> please join me in thanking Dr. Thank Frank you. Buckley. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended and acted an event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa. <laughs>